FTSE Russell is an index provider and research house under the LSEG umbrella. They specialize in convening the best ideas on evolving market trends and helping to develop strategies for global investors. In this series, we look at the evolution of the biggest of today's trends. Twenty years ago, investors mocked the launch of the first ESG-focused index called FTSE for Good. But two decades later, interest in ESG indices is driving some of the biggest allocations of capital today. To understand more about how this happened, I chatted with Tony Campos, Head of Sustainable Investments at LSEG. Okay, so Tony, I want to, uh, if you don't mind, go a little bit back to basics. Um, I want to know, you say you've been there 17 years, were there even any real like ESG style indices even back then? And like going over the last 17 years, how has that product changed and who are your clients and who uses the, the products that you have? 20 years ago, FTSE launched FTSE for Good, one of the first ever global ESG indexes. So that actually predates my time at the company. Right. Um, I believe I was the fourth person to join focused on ESG in 2004. But FTSE for Good at the time was quite important and different. Um, now, if we think over the last 20 years, I say often sustainable investment has changed a lot over that time, but one thing has really stayed consistent, which is a lack of definitions and standards. That's one so of the biggest challenges we have. Can I ask about just FTSE for good? So back then, mm -hmm. how, would, um, how would FTSE have gone about constructing that index? So the real concept here is you start with your standard market cap weighted universe because you want broad exposure. Our clients are looking for broad, diversified global equity A exposure. big liquid names case. as well. Exactly. <clears throat> now, from an ESG perspective, you have to define how you're going to set transparent rules for how you will define who gets in and who gets out. For FTSE for Good, we look at that through two dimensions of corporate ESG practices and behavior. One is thinking about company conduct. So what's the risk management and impact of the company's day-to-day -day operations from an environmental and social perspective? But you can also think about the impact of the company's products mm -hmm. and their use in society. Some can be negative, some can be positive. So it's possible to have a company that makes environmentally beneficial products like solar panels or wind turbines, but treats their employees poorly, or maybe manufactures those products in an environmentally harmful way. Mm. Equally, you could have a company who Maybe their products are um, focused on, uh, produce something like tobacco, mm -hmm. um, but they do so in a fairly environmentally thoughtful way. Okay. So you don't just look at environmental impact, it's a lot about corporate culture as well. So how about corporate culture and the way people treat employees and diversity? How, how do you measure that? So that's a big challenge. Um, it's one that I think the industry is pretty aware of but ultimately the disclosure from companies is not yet sufficient enough to allow us to make fully informed decisions about diversity and inclusion. Mm. Um, part of the reason for that is uh, the publicly available data um, that's, that's provided is, is sparse and difficult to compare across mm. time, across regions, across sectors. As the years go by and ESG becomes a bigger and bigger topic, are there becoming ways of measuring ESG more easily with companies and does that does that then help you you know create products create indices which are more sort of aligned with what you're trying to achieve yeah absolutely so there's been a great development in the quality of data that's being disclosed and therefore the tools and models that can utilize that data right. now that quality of disclosure still isn't as good as it needs to be but it's much better than where we were certainly 20 years ago when FTSE for good launched okay so let's, we'll, we'll come on to the future in a sec, but let's go back to FTSE for Good. So that was really the sort of pioneering product, which I imagine at the time didn't probably get a huge amount of attention because, uh, you know, people simply want to make money. Now, it did get a lot of attention. Oh, oh, sorry. When it was launched, it was panned in the UK press. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, and <laughs> so there was an interesting amount of pushback uh, from UK listed companies at the time. Right. Um, however, I think since then, the nature of that engagement from companies with the ESG agenda, particularly as it comes to ratings and indexes, has changed pretty dramatically. So talk about the last 15 years and how products have increased and exactly how they're designed and built and what your involvement is there. Yeah, so the main client base for us is going to be large asset owners and investment managers. Uh, now, the, the, the use of indexes for those investors is often as the basis for um, passive equity allocation in our case. Mm -hmm. So they're using um, market cap weighted indexes uh, 
uh, to get their exposure to particular markets. Um, and from an ESG perspective, you can introduce criteria and rules to help inform how that index gets created. Mm -hmm. A lot of the work we're doing today is specifically uh, focused on ensuring we match the underlying index universe and risk return profile. So there's no discrepancy in performance or risk, but you are getting that ESG impact. Right. Five to 10 years ago, how many of your clients or would have a specific ESG mandate and how many sort of now do? And what's the dynamic of, of that change? So how many people are, well, basically what's the demand for that product like? There's two different answers really. One is on the institutional side, the other is more for retail and individual investors. On the institutional side, those sort of thematic investments or allocations specific to ESG strategies uh, are not as common. What we're seeing there is large asset owners like some of the biggest pension plans in the world mm. looking to not spe put specific money into ESG portfolios, but rather integrate ESG into their standard investment allocation and strategies. That means for us, re-engineering their standard traditional benchmarks to be okay. more ESG integrated. Okay. For individual investors and say, for example, uh, financial advisors, wealth managers, and say an investment product like an ETF, you are often more focused on uh, thematic uh, ESG concepts and impact. So you're probably being a little bit more strict on some of the ESG criteria to be able to demonstrate you know, how the index is different and what impact you're getting. And Tony, who ultimately makes the decision between which companies are in and which companies are out? Is there a committee or are you in charge of that? So one of the benefits of indexes is they're all rules-based and transparent. Right. Coming back to my original comment around lack of standardization and definitions here, the reality is there's a range of preferences for mm -hmm. sustainable investment in ESG. So the rules for any index will determine who gets in and who gets out. But just like any index, those decisions are, you know, have some uh, subjectivity in them. Mm. Uh, if we're dealing with an index product that's meant to be very uh, exclusive, what we would classify as a kind of best in class type group, uh, then those, those rules will be very restrictive. If we're trying on the other hand to match benchmark like returns with some ESG improvement, maybe carbon reduction, those rules could be quite different. Mm. And in that case, we need to make sure that we're transparent, we need to make sure the rules are available so clients can understand what they're buying because there's no one way to do ESG. And have you seen real significant pickup in demand on both the institutional and retail side over the past few years? And what's, that, what's the dynamic of that been? Yeah, it's, it, it's been pretty remarkable. So um, if we look at just uh, some recently published numbers yeah. on our uh, assets passively tracking our sustainable investment indexes, as of June last year, it was about 60 billion in AUM. As of June this year, about 160 billion. Wow. So pretty great growth. What's driving that uh, is a few things. On the retail side, what we're seeing is you know, n more fund flows into existing products. So ETFs that use some of our indexes okay. so are that's more of a technical thing. generating more and more asset flows. Uh -huh. Part of the reason for that is more financial advisors are, are becoming aware and comfortable you know, uh, allocating into ESG solutions. It also helps some of those ETFs that have now been around for three years have an established track record. Mm -hmm. On the institutional side, what we're seeing is demand for climate-specific solutions. A lot of the, the largest asset owners in the world think about climate change as the number one risk uh, for their time horizon. And what they're looking to do is make sure that their indexes, which they often you know, uh, passively track uh, for their global equity exposure, are aligned for a climate transition in the future. Uh, we help them do that by re-engineering the benchmark, essentially reweighting companies rather than deciding some companies come out, some companies come in. We want to keep that broad exposure. We just want to weight more to the leaders and underweight some of those that may be left behind in the climate transition. And for asset owners, that's a big part of the demand. Now, you said it went from 60 billion to 160 billion, which is obviously great, but I think in the, in the grand scheme of things, these are still relatively small numbers. So, I mean, can you make any kind of prediction about what you think that number goes to? And, you know, without getting too political, what needs to happen to people really wake up and dedicate significant amount of their portfolio to ESG? Is it uh, a price on carbon? Uh, is, it, uh, is it tax changes? What's your current view? So for the first question, I think it's really important to think, yes, this is still a very small part of the market. From that perspective of assets tracking, we've seen an explosion in new uh, investment solutions and products an explosion in AUM into those, um, mm -hmm. into those products, but it's still you know, starting from a very small base. 
But I think it's important to, re to remember that ESG is not just about sort of products and investment products. For a lot of our clients, it's about process. Mm. So particularly for active managers that maybe aren't managing an ESG fund or marketing an ESG fund, it's about their investment decision-making process. So a big part of this is about data and information benchmarking so they can improve the way they make investment decisions to incorporate environmental, social, and governance issues. That doesn't mean that the strategy is an ESG strategy. It might still be a, a US large cap strategy or a value strategy or an emerging market strategy, but now they're just being overtly conscious about understanding where those ES and G risks lie, making sure it fits into their investment decision making. And are we talking about, um, I mean, is, does this start to become a bit of a virtuous circle with the, the, the tail wagging the dog a bit? It's like these corporates who um, are seeing the way investors are changing their mind in terms of dedicating more money to ESG, is that forcing these board of, boards of directors and, and senior people at companies to, to readjust their priorities? Yeah, it's really forcing those companies, first and foremost, to be transparent about what their uh, approach to managing ESG risks are. Yeah. Um, so right now, there's you know a, still a huge need for more and better data mm. on the way companies manage ESG risks. Um, in pretty much every market globally, with very few exceptions, uh, this is voluntarily reported data. There's no regulatory obligation for some of these things, which means there's a lot of qualitative data and assessment available, mm -hmm. uh, and it's very hard to compare. Um, now, that is changing in some dimensions, and there's a lot of market-led initiatives that are helping develop frameworks for corporate reporting, particularly around things like climate-related risks. So that's helping companies bring more information uh, to the market. But that's being market-led. So some of the biggest you know, asset owners, asset managers are putting pressure on the issuers mm. to bring more information to the market. Do you feel more hopeful about the future after um, you know, forums like COP26? Do you feel that enough is being done? So I think optimism, yes. <laughs> uh, caution, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's still a very scary situation we're in. Mm. There is great momentum and one of the benefits or, or I think main outcomes of COP26 will be a recognition that finance is at the center yeah. of climate change. Uh, and now there's gonna be a, a increased focus on you know, improving the data to the market, mm -hmm. um, establishing that market infrastructure for climate risk in particular, uh, so that investors can make more informed decisions. Now the key ingredient that is missing is still a price on carbon. Let's talk about the price on carbon uh, briefly because when do you foresee that happening? Is it something that's ha gonna happen in the short term or is this something that gets kicked down the road? It's really hard to say. Uh, I think one thing that we can take some you know, uh, positive um, momentum from is the fact that investors are starting to act even without that price on carbon. Because am I right in thinking, that I think even some of the large oil companies are even asking for this as well. So you do feel that you know, even large corporates are, uh, are on board. Well, you know, markets and companies want certainty. Um, and right. you know that, that will help everyone make some of these longer term <clears throat> decisions. Right now, uh, it's a question of are we gonna be slamming on the brakes or you know, how gently can we slam on the brakes, perhaps is a better way to think about it. Uh, now, many of the uh, particularly asset owners that we're working with that are trying to think about the low carbon transition and ready their portfolios, uh, what, they're, what they're trying to do is you know, take decisions now, so not waiting, but also giving themselves some flexibility. So from the perspective of an index and data provider, that means uh, you know, transparent frameworks that can be effectively ratcheted up or dialed down over time. Mm. Um, so the way that we might create a climate transition index and uh, right now uh, could look very different in five years time. Uh, once the data is better, maybe mm -hmm. decarbonization is, is happening more rapidly and you need to be a little bit more aggressive. At the same time, maybe things go slower or maybe there's a market event that you need to account for. So having kind of the flexibility and you know, kind of the, the way in which you apply some of these um, climate risk data models into index construction is really important for the future. So let's talk about the future then, Tony. So um, kind of a crystal ball question, but if you were to look out five years to 2026, what do you think um, the world of sustainable investing looks like now, the world of indices? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll certainly see um, greater sort of global adoption of you know, some of the um, sort of regulatory and market-led initiatives that, that are coming out of, out of Europe and the EU. Um, so there is a pretty well-established sort of framework for um, classifying uh, green impact um, coming out of the European Union. We'll start to see other markets start to adopt similar taxonomies, if not exactly that, and more regulation, uh, more um, disclosure uh, 
um, improvement from, from corporates. But for investors, I think what we'll see is a reallocation of existing capital into more ESG-focused solutions, more sustainable-focused solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, that means you know, uh, really an asset transition from sometimes market cap weighted benchmarks and allocations. So those largest asset owners like your big government pension plan that today, you know, are, are invested in the market cap weighted, um, you know, uh, Russell U.S. indices or FTSE global indices um, will start to, you know, want to take some of that money and put it into the climate transition aligned versions of those benchmarks. Mm -hmm. So it won't exactly be about new money being allocated in some of those scenarios, yeah. but rather a reallocation. And that's a signal to the market. Uh, around you know how some of these solutions can be enacted, uh, mm -hmm. which will help you know raise visibility and also demonstrate you know for some of the smaller sized asset owners and other uh, and, and other investors you know kind of rules for the road. And just because it's such a hot topic at the moment, the world of digital assets and and AI, um, as those two influences come into the world of finance, how can you use them to you know further improve your products, or how could they influence the world of investing? Definitely from a data point of view, it can be very helpful. Right. So right now, a big limiting factor, and, and this really has been the case you know, throughout the last you know, 20 years that we've been working in sustainable investment, you know, the, the disclosure from companies can be a limiting factor. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, you have to model out data to fill in some gaps. Uh, and sometimes, you need to look at non-corporate reported sources of information, uh, media sources, sometimes even including social media sources. And that sort of big data effort, unstructured data effort, requires you know, certain technologies to not only bring a machine all that to data read it in, for you. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, not only to bring it in, but increasingly to introduce some type of sentiment analysis into yeah. what you're reading. Yeah. And that's really crucial. It's also very difficult from our perspective in terms of uh, rules and transparency and objectivity, yeah. um, because it's really hard to, to, to sort of put some structure around that. So there's a balance we have to read, uh, reach between you know, sort of the use of some of that, um, uh, those data collection techniques and assessment techniques versus kind of the transparency we have to put into the index product. Well, Tony, it's been so great chatting with you. I just want to say thank you so much for your time. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thanks, Tony. Sustainable investing and the role of ESG in corporate culture was something that was certainly talked about for 10 years, but it didn't really translate into investment opportunities. But now, due to the rise of indices allowing more direct investment into ESG and sustainable themes, capital allocations are accelerating these trends, creating opportunities that are only going to get bigger and more diverse in the future. If you'd like to read more on this topic, please go to footsierussell.com forward slash research, where you'll find much more information.